Hi, I'm Steve Latham with the Yale Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics, and I'm speaking today with Jeff Matzler, who's Hi. teaching in our summer program. So I want to start out, Jeff, by having you uh, tell us a little bit about your own background and your experience with bioethics, your education, and of course your military background. Sure. I grew up in West Texas. At, um, I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, while there, got a master's in divinity and uh, I became a minister. At, uh, after I became a minister, um, ordained in the Methodist Church, I at that time became a United States Army chaplain sent by my church to the military. And uh, that, that process started in 1994, so I've been doing this quite a while. Hmm. But for the last five years, uh, I've, I've, been doing, uh, uh, I've been doing ethics for the United States Army, and, and right now I'm the bioethicist for the United States Army. Uh, I have a degree from Duke University in Ethics, and then in 2014 came to Yale and uh, got a degree here at Yale and studying bioethics, and of course, uh, studied under you for part of that mm -hmm. degree. Really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, now I, uh, I'm stationed out of Washington, D.C. Uh, my office is at Bethesda, Maryland at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, uh, and uh, from there, uh, for United States Army Medical Command, I travel around the country and the globe to the different uh, military facilities, training and educating staff on military medical ethics, which is one of the mandates from uh, the Department of Defense uh, for all of our military medical staff and faculty. I also teach at the, at the medical school at Bethesda at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. At, uh, you know, there I teach uh, in the graduate nursing program you know, the, at the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine, uh, teaching mm -hmm. medical ethics or bioethics at each of those. And before you were entering the ethics area, you had been deployed as a chaplain uh, in right. Afghanistan? And yes, in yes. Yeah, five combat deployments uh, to, uh, over the years. Uh, everywhere from the, the later stages of Desert Storm through uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. So um, what are you teaching in the summer program this summer? I'm teaching military medical ethics. Not uh, surprising. That's right. okay. Yeah. And describe what's some of the content of that. All right. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing that we talk about in there is the um, distinct uh, dichotomy between civilian medical ethics and military medical ethics. Uh, people don't always think about this, but soldiers live within a different social construct legally than the rest of society does. In fact, society in the United States functions under uh, the, the United States Constitution for their rights. Uh, the soldiers in the military and, and all DOD personnel, not just soldiers, serve under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which has a very different set of social rules and laws because this community exists to protect this community. And so this community, in order to do that, one of, the, one of the key differences is lacks, um, uh, to the degree that the rest of society does, a sense of autonomy. They have a very restricted sense of autonomy, and that changes the balance when you're doing ethics with this community. Um, can you give an example? Sure. Uh, in, in, in the United States military, if you are training and you're injured, and you go to the hospital, and there may be a standard of care or multi multiple standards of care and alternate standards and alternate uh, ways to care for an injury or an illness, it's not the soldier but the commander of the soldier, not the hospital commander, but the unit commander that makes the decision on which of these avenues of care ultimately that the soldier is going to have. And they make that decision based on and which will cause the mission to be that's accomplished. That's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I mean, instead of, in, instead of the, uh, the medical oath, to take care of the individual, the best way for the individual at all times. It's more of a public health concept of uh, whatever's best for the unit and the mission of the unit is what we have to do ultimately. Mm -hmm. So in addition to this contemporary uh, military medical ethics stuff that you've been teaching, I know you've also done some really interesting work on St. Francis. Can you yeah. say a little bit about St. Sure, Francis? Sure, sure. My, my, my work with St. Francis actually comes out of my work with moral injury. At, uh, the, the, you know, what we've learned over the last 200 years and, and what we're finding out that we've always known uh, as, as, a, as a species is that war is this event that causes um, uh, terrible internal injury uh, and pain. Uh, we talk about that in the medical world right now using the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, uh, but it, uh, there's an aspect to the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder that 
doesn't match the reality of what soldiers are experiencing. Uh, the, the, the element of that is PTSD uh, as a, basically is a, is a diagnosis, and it used to be a subcategory of anxiety disorder. But along with the anxiety associated with war, there's also the issue of guilt and shame. That's a separate issue that isn't, that, that the, neither the diagnosis nor the treatment of PTSD deals with the, 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 the issues that happen when someone violates their moral code, even if they're doing so for their country and for the mission, you know, so the, uh, you know, whatever needs to happen in order to succeed. And so, um, whenever I was at Duke University working on my degree in ethics, I took a look at historical models of, of soldiers who had found ways to deal with this moral pain. And, and the most striking model that I found came from the 13th century in Italy, where a soldier uh, who gathered uh, with other veterans from both, both his buddies that he'd fought with for the last 18 years, and with enemies from the other side who had fought and killed his friends and brothers, and they'd fought and killed his friends and brothers. And originally 13 of them came together and started living together in community. And in doing so, uh, the, the terms, when they're translated out of medieval Italian, are that they experienced um, ultimate joy. Uh, and one of the issues and problems with PTSD is we can use, through group therapy and pharmaceuticals, we can get a person to the point where they don't feel any pain but we can't restore their joy. And, and this, this guy in the 13th century that did this is someone we've all heard of. He was a, combat, he was a career combat warrior. He was a POW. Um, we know him best uh, from, how we, from how we think of him after all that when we refer to him as St. Francis of Assisi. But uh, he only became St. Francis because of that transformation that happened as he moved out of moral injury into res restoration and, 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 and joy. In, and in fact, there's very good historical evidence for his showing symptoms of PTSD that, that's right. before he had his converting That's experience. exactly right. You can take uh, the DSM and you can line up um, the, the symptoms for PTSD. And of course, I'm not, I'm not a doctor and you can't diagnose someone who's been dead 800 years, but you can take the symptoms from the book and you can take the first account, sort, the, the original source material written by the people that knew him about him, about what he did and the, the actions he took and the symptoms that he had, and, and it checks the block for PTSD right down the line. And all of his original followers were fellow soldiers. That's right. They were all, of, of the original 13, 12 were soldiers, and the one that wasn't a soldier was the priest who had been their minister or their chaplain. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Yeah. So uh, tell me what you've liked about the summer program. Well, one, one of the best things uh, about the summer program, first of all, is being back in New Haven. But um, uh, what I really like is getting the chance. Uh, I, I live in a very secluded world in the United States military. We, we do a lot of neat stuff. And um, I, I think people have, however, a very skewed um, image of what we do. And uh, even the way that we do um, medical research and ethics in our medical research. And it's been really neat over the last couple of years to get to sit down with people and share with them uh, uh, specifically what we do and how, you know, what we're doing in the realm of bioethics and our research and our treatment. And, and letting people learn that if anything, we're not you know, doing less for our soldiers, we're actually treating them with a higher level of care and, and respect for dignity than you'll see even in, even in some of the best hospitals and some of the best research programs in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's neat to, to have that dialogue, but also to, um, to share and to break some of those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Well, good. And have you, uh, well, I, I know you've also brought people from, uh, from Yale down to, to speak at Walter Reed. That's right. Uh, twice a year at Walter Reed, we have, um, we have, we have a national, uh, con one conference and one symposium. One is a 40-hour program on bioethics, uh, what, it, you know, what, it, what bioethics is and how to do it in a military setting. And when our, when our military personnel go to that or anyone who wants to come, come to that, they can get a certificate saying they've been through that program. Uh, the other thing we do is once a year we have a two to three day event where we bring in some of the world's top folks and talk about what's going on currently with bioethics in a particular theme. And we've been able over the last uh, two years to bring down for each one of those 
uh, people that have either been involved in this program or are even still directly involved here at Yale with bioethics. So it's been a neat way to keep the relationships there. Great. Well, thank you very much for sitting down and being interviewed. Thank you, And Steve. thanks for teaching this summer program. Honored to be here. Thanks. Great.